Hello, ladies and gentlemen. On this occasion, we will describe how we perform the interscaline block, the gold standard for shoulder surgery, as a sole technique for shoulder arthroscopy. Interscaline brachial plexus block is the most widely used postoperative analgesic technique for shoulder surgeries. It not only provides excellent postoperative analgesia, but also reduces pain scores and opioid consumption. It involves the injection of a local anesthetic agent into the interscaline groove, which is the space between the anterior and middle scalene muscles in the neck. This blocks specifically the superior trunk C5 and C6 and the middle trunk C7. As of now, the interscaline block continues to be the established regional gold standard for shoulder surgery. While studies suggest a 100% rate of phrenic nerve block with elevated volumes, in reality, only a limited number of patients encounter symptoms indicative of phrenic paralysis. Confronted with this undesirable outcome, it is advisable for patients with respiratory issues to contemplate the adoption of an alternative analgesic approach. In an anatomical analysis, it is noteworthy that the principal nerves governing the innervation of the shoulder joint emanate from the brachial plexus, exerting pivotal functions in furnishing both sensory and motor innervation to the shoulder joint. The notable nerves encompass suprascapular nerve, axillary nerve, subscapular nerves, lateral pectoral nerve, and musculocutaneous nerve. Performing any approach above the clavicle, supraclavicular approaches, would result in a simultaneous block of all branches involved in shoulder innervation. Specifically, with the interscaline approach to the brachial plexus, which we will discuss shortly, an anesthetic and analgesic block of all these branches is achieved. We suggest initiating the scan from the supraclavicular fossa, where we can identify a cluster of grape-like images adhering to the lateral aspect of the pulsating subclavian artery. This image will correspond to the rearrangement of the trunks, superior, middle, and inferior, to form the divisions. Employing a traceback method, carefully slide the transducer in a cephalic direction. At this level, the anterior and middle scalene muscles lie deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, with the interscalene groove between the two prominent muscles. The nerve roots of the brachial plexus will be visualized as oval or round hypoechoic structures located in the groove between the anterior and middle scalene muscles, where they are tightly clustered within their facial sheath. Here the C57 roots of the brachial plexus appear as three vertically aligned round hypoechoic structures, sometimes referred to as the traffic light sign. The goal of this nerve block is to place the needle in the tissue space between the anterior and middle scalene muscles and inject local anesthetic until the spread around the brachial plexus is documented by ultrasound. To accurately identify each of the roots that make up the brachial plexus, we will rely on the shadow generated by the transverse processes at each level. The root will correspond to a round to oval structure in between. The C7 transverse process has a single posterior tubercle which is why C7 is considered the transition vertebra. As we move the cephalad, transverse processes of C6, C5, and C4 have a double tubercle, one anterior and one posterior. Initiating the scan from the supraclavicular fossa and sliding our transducer cephalad, the cervical level is determined by identifying the transverse process of the seventh and sixth cervical vertebrae. The seventh cervical transverse process differs from the above levels because it usually has a rudimentary anterior tubercle and one prominent posterior tubercle. By moving the transducer cranially, the transverse process of the sixth cervical spine comes into the image with the characteristic sharp anterior tubercle, after which the consecutive cervical spinal level can easily be identified. At higher levels than C6, the anterior tubercle becomes shorter and equal to the posterior tubercle with a shallow groove in between. Another way to determine the cervical spinal level is by following the vertebral artery, which runs anteriorly at the C7 level before it enters the foramen of the C6 transverse process in about 90% of cases. However, it enters at C5 or higher in about 10% of cases. The goal is to identify the anterior and middle scalene muscles and the elements of the brachial plexus that are located between them.
The needle is then inserted in plane toward the brachial plexus, typically in a lateral to medial direction. The needle should always be aimed in between the roots instead of directly at them in order to minimize the risk of accidental nerve injury. We must be cautious during needle advancement through the middle scalene muscle, as the dorsal scapula and long thoracic nerves have already diverged from the superior trunk and may occasionally be visualized within the muscle's depth. After careful aspiration to rule out intravascular needle placement, 1 to 2 ml of local anesthetic is injected to verify proper needle placement between the superior and medial trunk. When injection of the local anesthetic does not appear to result in a spread around the brachial plexus, additional needle repositioning and injections may be necessary. There is a keen interest in pinpointing the optimal location for administering local anesthetics during an interscaline block as the chosen injection site significantly influences the quality of the block. Intraplexus injection involves administering the local anesthetic between the C5 and C6 nerve roots within the sheath surrounding the brachial plexus. On the other hand, extraplexus injections, as demonstrated in the video, entail injecting the local anesthetic between the superior C5 and C6 roots and medial trunk C7 root. In addition to the joint innervation provided by the brachial plexus, the supraclavicular nerve originating from the superficial cervical plexus collects the innervation of the skin over the upper part of the chest, the upper, middle, and lateral parts of the shoulder. When high volumes are used in interscalene block, simultaneous blockade of the superficial cervical plexus, including its supraclavicular branch, is assumed. However, due to the routine use of ultrasound for these procedures, there has been a drastic reduction in the volumes used, sometimes less than 10 milliliters. Currently, it is recommended to perform the supraclavicular branch or the superficial cervical plexus block independently, especially if the patient is undergoing surgery without general anesthesia. A small hypoechoic structure can be identified originating from the root of C4 and lying superficial to the deep investing layer of cervical fascia at the level of the C4 and C5 nerve roots. Scanning caudally, this structure passes superficially over the belly of scalenus medius, deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. We deposit 2 to 3 ml of a local anesthetic around the branches. When preparing for shoulder surgery, the patient's position is a crucial aspect. The specific position can vary based on the type of shoulder surgery being performed. Most arthroscopic shoulder procedures can be reliably performed either in the beach chair or the lateral decubitus position. It's important to note that the choice of position depends on the surgeon's preference, the nature of the shoulder problem, and the surgical approach. In our environment, the most commonly used position is the lateral decubitus position. The main advantage of this position is that with traction on the arm, there is a good visualization of the joint and there is an adequate working space within the glenohumeral joint. The patient lies on their side with the affected shoulder facing up. The arm is held in traction parallel to its long axis. Utilizing an interscalene block of the brachial plexus allows for surgery with minimal sedation, ensuring optimal comfort for the patient. Is that right? No. Maintaining the patient in normal tension is essential, not only to prevent excessive bleeding during the procedure, but also to guarantee sufficient cerebral blood flow.